Hello, everybody. Hello. Welcome to the pre-conference reception. Uh, my understanding is that the pre-pre-conference reception was last night uh, when Jim Cates delivered a reading at University of Madison, sorry, University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, on campus. I heard it went really well. Um, warmed up the crowd for us. Um, so thank you, Jim, for doing that. Um, my name is Russell Valentino. I'm the Alta president. And I want to welcome you to the 37th annual Alta conference. Welcome. A big, a big thank you to Leah Leone, the, this year's chair of the conference organizing committee, standing right there. Please, thank you. Well, and obviously the obviously the members of the conference organizing committee every year every year do a great job. Um, I have a few announcements. Um, I want to just highlight a few things in the in the program. Um, the first is tomorrow morning, and I know you're all going to be up at six, and so by the time you get to this, you'll be warmed up and ready to go. 8 a.m. for those of you who haven't, who haven't been to an Alta conference before, Bill Johnston is um, holding the new attendees um, workshop, I suppose. It's a uh, how to get the most out of your Alta experience. Um, that's on the program, so you should be able to find it. It starts at eight. And then um, the Alta Fellows reading is tomorrow from 5 p.m. to 6.30, and that's followed immediately by the National Translation Award and, and uh, Lucian Strike Translation Prize reception, which is at 6.30. Then we'll go off-site to hold the Cafe Latino. It was back by popular demand last year. We had something like 85 bilingual readings, which was a record, 20 more than anyone could ever remember in Alta's history. And this year, we have 130, <laughs> which is a tribute to, yeah, which is a tribute to uh, the organizational skills and uh, personal uh, charisma of Alexis Levitin, who has organized the bilingual readings for many years. And so we'll take uh, a number of readings off-site to, to hold this Cafe Latino, which will be at La Perla Mexican restaurant. Um, it's uh, about a five-minute cab ride, I believe, um, and the address is in the program. Then uh, on Friday, the NTA long list reading is in the evening at 6.15, followed by um, the favorite uh, activity of a number of Alta attendees, the Declamacion, which will happen at 8.30. And then the keynote, um, we put it off till Saturday to save some of the best for last, and that'll happen at uh, 9.30. Um, Christopher Merrill will be delivering um, the annual plenary address um, at 9.30 on Saturday. And we'll have a closing reception this year. Um, it is a ticketed event. It's, I hope, not too steep a price. I believe it's $40. And there are some tickets left, and a number of students were um, uh, given complimentary tickets. Thank you to Marion Schwartz for organizing that effort. And that starts at 4 p.m. tomorrow, uh, 4 to 6 p.m. Uh, sorry, Saturday, Saturday, 4 to 6 p.m. Um, before we start some of the programming for this evening, I want to introduce um, Johannes Britz, who is the Provost and Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs at University of uh, Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Uh, he's the author of more than 90 scholarly publications. Most of his work is being done in close collaboration with the European Union, with UNESCO, and a number of African governments. Uh, Africa is his specialty. He has acted as a consultant for a number of African governments as well as private sector firms. He played a key role in the development of information ethics in Africa and co-organized the first ever Africa Information Ethics Conference in um, 2007 in South Africa. During 2009, he co-initiated a UNESCO and South African government funded training workshop on ethics and e government implementation in sub-Saharan Africa, and in recognition of his work, he was recently acknowledged as a finalist for the Ethics Award by the World Technology Forum. 
please join me in welcoming Johannes Britz. Thank you very much, Russell, and good evening, everybody. I will be short. I just want to welcome you all on behalf of our campus to Milwaukee um, on your 37th annual conference. I hope all your panels, your roundtable discussions, your workshops, and your networking will be very successful. I've learned a lot already just by being here tonight. I'm not in the translation business that much, uh, although I did also study theology, where we did a lot of hermeneutics and translation. But a lot of you are doing extremely interesting research and work. Um, I hope also that your stay here in Milwaukee would be pleasant, that you will enjoy it, that you will not be bothered by the weather, and um, that you will spend some money here before you go back home. <laughs> um, actually, I came here as a visiting professor in 2001, and I simply fell in love with the place, and I came back permanent in January of 2005. And then I became a citizen because I said I want to vote and I want to travel, and I never look back. I really enjoy it here. I also want to just express my gratitude, uh, um, Leah, and my appreciation for the work that all of you are doing. And I will say a few things about what I think about language and why I think it's so important, specifically on our campus and the online programs that you're running on our campus. If you ever think of something interdisciplinary, and if you ever think of something that can make a difference on campus, I always say my background, Immunuria, Humanities, Languages, I've studied six languages, not that I know them all, just to say how I value that. I always tell people, if you think of an MBA without languages, you will not be successful because the world has so many languages that I do value that so much with all the disciplines we have. Um, on languages, and many times as a provost, people ask you, where, you know, what about the humanities? What about languages? What is the future of languages? And it has my full support. My children in my house, uh, we have a family of two, 11 and 14-year-olds. They speak Afrikaans, my native language, although they grew up here, even though the Afrikaans is with the Wisconsin accent. And we've gone home. <laughs> people don't really understand them initially because it's different, but it's so special and unique. And if I do spelling tests with my daughter, it's about a translation because of my accent. So she will smile and say, let me see the word before I spell the word for you because I say it differently. But that's just, translation is much more just translating words. I also think languages just burn bridges or it can build bridges. Back to my own history in South Africa, as you know, the 1976, maybe you don't know that, part of the history in South Africa, the uprising against the apartheid regime was really activated in 1976 when it really had mass uh, involvement based on language. It was a key issue that really activated the mass action through schools as Afrikaans was the language of uh, instruction. But also my own people, the Afrikaner people, built identity in the 18th century around language, around the Afrikaans language, versus English or Dutch. And I do think, you know, again, back to my own history in South Africa, if you ever wanted to find solutions to problems, you learn one another's language. As a white person, I learned Greek and Hebrew and Latin and German and Dutch and English and Afrikaans, but I never learned Kosa and Zulu and Sisutu. So I always, when I was in an elevator with students, and they can speak Zutu, Sulu or, or Kosa, I didn't understand them. And I said, wow, what an empowerment. They can speak Afrikaans and English, and I can't speak their language. So if you ever are a politician, force people to learn the language where you are. And that's why I tell my children, if you grow up in the US, you also learn Spanish, because I do think it's so important and not just English. So that's for me a very important part. I also think there's no one, we should move away. I know I'm too idealistic here. But I don't think one common language like English on the internet or French or whatever is the solution to a global economy. I think allow people to who they are and who they want to be. In South Africa, we joke many times, we say the official language is bad English, because <laughs> that's how we talk. We don't care if you say he is, she is, we is, as long as we understand one another. But the respect for somebody else by speaking their language and by making a useful and a meaningful translation the work you do is a reflection of respect for other cultures. And it just opens so much more in a global world when we are more respectful. I'm very concerned about how many languages are dying out in the world, specifically in Africa, where people feel kind of this, I want to say stupid, but that's not the right word, but the sense of, oh, I'm so good if I can just speak English and I don't preserve my own language. 
I think it's so important, that proudness in your own language. <clears throat> I also think if you're good at languages, you're just good at politics and you're good at business, and you're just good at understanding social and culture of other peoples. And for me, if I look at you, and I see the cost of translations and the need for translations, I tell students, if you want to find a good job, combine your economics or your MBA with a translation ability because there are so many opportunities. If you're just smart to start your own business, there are jobs in languages. It is a key, important role in the future of job creation. And then I always tell people when they say, are we on the same page? I say, no, we're not just on the same page. Same handwriting and same language. That means understanding. Enjoy your conference, and thank you, Leah, for asking me to be here tonight. Thank you very much, and enjoy. Thank you. So um, a big part of this evening's event is um, a celebration of the life and uh, legacy of Michael Henry Heim. And I'm going to talk a little bit about um, a book uh, that is um, helping us do that in a couple of minutes. Uh, first, I would like to introduce Esther Allen, who is going to talk a little bit about Michael and his life and work. Please welcome Esther Allen. I just have an initial question. How many people in this room knew Michael Henry Heim personally? A good percentage, a very good percentage. Um, so when I hold up this cover, you all recognize exactly what it shows. Um, uh, Russell and Sean Cotter, who's over there, and I uh, conceived a book at Alta in Kansas City. This, this book was conceived in a bar in Kansas City. <laughs> and um, it contains a photo of the three of us just post-conception and we're all just radiant and glowing. We're really happy. For some reason, I'm the one who got nominated to come up here and speak about the book. Um, and I just want to tell, for those of you who didn't raise your hand and who might be puzzled, why are, who is this Michael Henry Heim and why are we honoring him here tonight? Those of you who did raise your hand know perfectly well and are going to know everything I say. But for the rest of you, I just wanted to speak very briefly about him, about why we decided to do a book about him, and about all that he gave in his life, not just to this community, but to the entire culture and, dare I say it, the entire world. Um, and I want to do that very, very briefly just by telling you um, three or four things about Mike. Uh, let's start with the story of how I met him. Um, I had obviously read a number of his books, as most of you, even those who might not recognize the name, probably have as well. Um, Mike, on his webpage at UCLA, where he was a professor of Slavic languages, listed about 24 books. And I would always look at that page and say, wait, but I know he translated that book, and that book isn't on the page, and wait, wh wh why isn't that book on the page? And so after he passed away in 2012, I went and did uh, some bibliographic research and found the list of all the books that he had done, and it was 61 books, um, including titles like The Unbearable Lightness of Being by Milan Kundera, um, the, the Number Devil by uh, Hans Magnus Enzenberger, uh, lots of books by Dubravka Ugrisic. You're going to be hearing later on a number of the books that Mike translated, and many of them will undoubtedly be familiar to you. If you've read anything from Eastern Europe, you've probably read Mike. Um, and uh, so one day, out of the blue, I get an email from this translator of so many books that I've read who I had never met before. And at that point in my life, I was working with Penn American Center, and this email said, I want to talk to you about something. We must set up a meeting, set up a meeting at the Penn offices, and I'll come straight from the airport because I'm arriving in New York from LA on a red eye. So I, I was very excited to meet this famous translator and set up the meeting, as I was told, and made sure that the executive director was there because I'd been told to do that. 
And Mike walked in, sat down, and you know how meetings go on and on. Mike opened his mouth and said, I want to give this organization half a million dollars to support the translation of books into English. <laughs> no preamble, just that. And none of us had ever met him before. And the story is incredible in many ways. It's incredible because when the money actually came in, it wasn't half a million dollars. It was $734,000. Why the difference? Mike knew that he wanted to give us the money from a certain bank account, but he was totally uninterested in money. In fact, he sort of hated money. And he just didn't know how much money was in the bank account because he couldn't be bothered to look because that would have engaged him with money, which he hated. Um, so it was $734,000. Where was this money from? How did he happen to have a bank account with $734,000 in it? Well. Interesting story, Mike was the child of a father that he never really knew because his father was a Hungarian po composer, a Hungarian composer of gypsy tunes. And uh, his father, like many people from outside the United States, enrolled in the US Army during World War II um, to gain citizenship, but also to defend America, and was killed. And Mike's mother received a death benefit from the US government and she didn't want to spend the money. It was sacred money. It was the father's death money. She invested it. She never touched it. No one ever touched it. And that was the money that Mike donated in 2003 to support translation. Um, to date, the Penn Translation Fund, which is now called the Penn Heim Translation Fund, and there's another footnote there, the one condition of Mike's donation was that it be absolutely anonymous. So even those of you who raised your hands when I asked if you knew Mike Heim were undoubtedly really surprised to learn in 2012 when he passed away that he was the donor of the Penn Translation Fund because nobody knew. Mike hated money and didn't want to be associated with money in any way, including as the donor of this incredible fund. Um, so Mike's donation of that fund makes us wonder, who was this man? What kind of person was he? How, what else did he give? Um, well, for one thing, he gave unstintingly of his time for seven years, not just to give the money for the fund, which he regarded as nothing, but to set up the fund, to establish its functioning, to make sure that it worked well, to make sure that it was effective in promoting the work of young translators, to make sure that it was effectively getting more work published in translation in English in the United States. And I, I regard the fund as being a sort of constellation of things that happened around 10 years ago that just really jump-started translation again in the United States. If you think about it, Words Without Borders is celebrating its 10th anniversary. Archipelago Books is celebrating its 10th anniversary. There's just, if you, if you want to think about the number of translation-oriented projects that began in the last 10 or 12 years, it's sort of amazing. And I think Mike is one of the catalysts of all that energy by, by just showing up with this money and saying, this is really important, and I'm going to do something about it. Um, what else can I tell you about Mike? Uh, he spoke 18 languages. Um, he didn't translate from all of them because when he felt that there were really good translators working in a language, he didn't want to impinge on their territory. So he understood Polish well, but he never translated from Polish because there were a lot of people working in Polish that he admired. He understood Romanian, but he translated very little from Romanian because uh, he felt that that was being handled well. Um, and there were a lot of languages that he spoke but, but, but didn't bother translating from. He translated from about 10 languages, depending on whether you think Serbo-Croatian is one or two. And um, that's not all he did. He uh, gave the world uh, the snow clone, uh, the award that I owe to Ellen Elias Bershak um, and, the, and to Sean Cotter, who wrote an incredible essay about it. Uh, do all of you know what a snow clone is? It's a fantastic thing. Um, the unbearable lightness of being. Think about how many times you've seen that repeated. Uh, the unbearable lightness of Bean, the unbearable whiteness of Portland, right? How many headlines, how many different permutations of that? That's a linguistic phenomenon known as a snow clone. It's not that easy to unleash a snow clone into the language. Mike Heim gave English a snow clone. He gave translation $734,000. He gave us 61 books. 
And he gave us one more thing, and then I'll stop. Um, many of you have probably read Raymond Carver. Um, the last story that Raymond Carver ever wrote was about the death of Chekhov, and it was sort of interesting because Raymond Carver himself died not long after writing the story, so you can't help but read it as being about Raymond Carver's own death because that's sort of, you know, the, the echoes and resonances are, are too strong to avoid that reading. Um, someone had said something to me about that story a long time ago, and when we were doing this book, as, as Sean was looking into all the permutations of the unbearable lightness of being, I thought, let's look into this Carver thing. So I looked more closely at this Carver story, which is called The Errand. And I discovered that every single place in this story where any of the Russian characters in the story speaks, and of course, Chekhov speaks in this story, Chekhov's circle, Chekhov's wife, Olga Knipper, they're all speaking throughout the story. The words are taken word for word from Michael Henry Heim's translations of Chekhov and his circle and his letters. Um, 28 sentences all together in the story, the sort of the pivotal heart of the story is Michael Henry Heim's work. So when I found that, I, I, I knew Mike had given us a lot. I didn't also, I didn't realize that he had also given us Raymond Carver's last story. Um, and I was a little, I didn't quite know what to do with that. And I decided, look, we read the story as being about Carver's death, even though it's about Chekhov's death. I think we can also read the story as being about Michael Henry Heim and all that he gave us. So I, I read that Carver story now when I read it as a tribute to him. And that was why we did this book to pay tribute to somebody who's really affected all of our lives. And you'll hear a lot more about him in the next, in the next few minutes. And you're all, by the way, all those of you who knew him and raised your hands, you're all invited to come up and talk about him because everybody has a Michael Henry Heim story and we wanna hear all of them. So thank you very much. So think about uh, if you have a story, well, not, not right this minute, because we're going to do one other thing before that. Um, and in order to do that, I want to invite a few people up here. Let me see what the list is. Um, I need some pages. I need some pages. Looks like we've got Olga Buchina and Sean Cotter, Alex Zucker, uh, Sarah Novich, uh, Esther Allen. Uh, Chad Post, Ellen Elias Borsach, Jen Groats. I think that's everybody. Come on up here. And um, we're going to do our best to read around this mic. So um, I guess I should tell you a word about this, should I? Yeah. Well, I say, so, um, yeah. Oh, they're there. Okay, great. Thank you. So thank you for putting that there. So uh, uh, some time ago, um, I was asked to do a reading in Mike's place. This was just after he had passed away, and I would have much preferred that he was there to do it, but I said, okay. And I didn't really want to fill it up with my words, so I thought, okay, I want to somehow I'll give the stage to him. But I didn't have enough time to really do it well. And doing it well, I thought, would have been compiling a number of texts that were translations that he had done, or at least excerpts from translations that he had done, asking a number of friends to read from them in uh, something like a compelling manner. Uh, and so that's what we did. And so um, we're going to read from, um, uh, Sean is going to be reading from um, the Encyclopedia of the Dead. No, that's, is that right? Yeah, so Sean is reading from the Encyclopedia of the Dead. Alex is reading from the Book of Laughter and Forgetting. Uh, Sarah is going to read from the Ministry of Pain. That's a Dubrovka Ugasic book. Uh, Olga is going to be, read from a delightful little children's book called Ed, uh, Uncle Fedya, His Dog and His Cat. Uh, I'm going to read from Too Loud a Solitude. Um, Chad is going to be le reading from Dancing Lessons for the Advanced in Age, the Bohemian Hrabble book. Esther Allen is going to read um, from one of the last stories that Mike translated. It's called The Student. It's a Chekhov story. Uh, Jen is going to be reading from uh, another wonderful Dubrovka Ugrasic book called The Fording the Stream of Consciousness. 
And let me see, did we get them all? No, one more. Uh, Ellen is going to read from a different section of the Encyclopedia of the Dead. And that's it, that's everybody. Okay, and I believe I can just let people do this, right? Go. Okay. Go right ahead. There once was a little boy named Fedya. His mother and father called him Uncle Fedya because he was very serious. He could read by the time he was four and make soup by the time he was six. He was a good little boy, and his parents loved him. Seventeen years after the death and miraculous resurrection of Jesus, the Nazarene, a man named Simon appeared on dusty roads that crisscrossed Samaria and vanished in the desert beneath fickle sands. A man his disciples called the Magus, and his enemies derided as the Borborite. The bloody massacre in Bangladesh quickly covered over the memory of the Russian invasion of Czechoslovakia. The assassination of Allende drowned out the groans of Bangladesh. The war in the Sinai Desert made people forget Allende. The Cambodian massacre made people forget Sinai, and so on and so forth until ultimately everyone lets everything be forgotten. Life is sometimes so confusing that you can't be certain what came first and what came later. By the same token, I don't know whether I'm telling this story to get to the end or the beginning of things. Since living abroad, I've experienced my native language, which, as the Croatian poet's ecstatic verse would have it, rustles, rings, resounds, and rumbles, thunders, roars, reverberates, as a stammer, a curse, a maldiction, or as babble, drab, phrase-mongering, devoid of meaning. Uncle Fede's only problem was this. His mother didn't like animals, especially cats. And because Uncle Fede loved animals, he and his mother often quarreled. One day, Uncle Fede was walking downstairs eating a sandwich when he saw a cat sitting on the window seat. Still, a big cat, a gigantic tabby cat. The student sighed and grew pensive. Still smiling, Vasilisa suddenly burst into sobs herself and tears, large and abundant, rolled down her cheeks and she shielded her face from the fire as if ashamed of them. And Lucaria, her eyes still fixed on the student, flushed and the look on her face grew heavy and tense like that of a person holding back great pain. The farmhands were returning from the river and one of them on horseback was close enough so that the firelight flickered over him. The student bade the widows good night and moved on. And again it was dark and his hands began to freeze. A cruel wind was blowing. Winter had indeed returned and it did not seem possible that the day after next would be Easter. Some claimed that he had come from a miserable Sumerian village named Jita. Others that he was from Syria or Anatolia. <laughs> Just like I come here to see you, young ladies, I used to go to church to see my beauties. Well, not exactly to church, I'm not much of a churchgoer, but to a small shop next to the parish house, a tiny little place where a man by the name of Altman sold secondhand sewing machines, dual spring Victrolas from America, and Minimax fire extinguishers. This story does not begin abruptly in medias res, but gradually as when night falls in the woods. They are dense oak woods, so dense that a ray of the setting sun breaks through the tree, trop, <clears throat> tree tops only here and there for a moment at the whim of a fluttering leaf, then drops to the ground like a spot of blood and disappears immediately. The girl does not notice it any more than she notices the day fading, the darkness coming on. The minister hated poets. They respected him. They were attracted by his antipathy. Poets are like children. There is only one thing they cannot stand, antipathy. Portia was a special case, a bastard and a sycophant like the others, true, but one who peddled his wares honestly, even gave an occasional factory reading. 
The reason the minister so despised poets was that poetry for him was like the mumps or the measles, something you got over when you were young. Besides, the only poetry that ever meant anything to him were the lyrics of the hit tunes he grew up with. Vanda would squeal with delight or giggle as if tickled whenever he sang, Be My Love, Your Dainty Little Hand, You Only Love Once, Besame Mucho, Domino, and other favorites of his youth. He didn't need self-styled poets shoving their creations in his face. The few books of poetry he'd been forced to read at the Pedagogical Institute had left no trace on him. What good were they? In fact, he took a dim view of literature in general, with one exception, Andrich. Andrich had won the Nobel Prize. He was world famous. That counted for something. She's absorbed in something else. She's following the vertiginous leap of a squirrel whose long tail glides along a tree trunk swiftly, giving the impression of two animals chasing each other, identical in movement and speed, yet different. The first, the real squirrel, is sleek and reddish brown. The second, following close behind, has longer, lighter colored fur. They are not, thinks the girl, more or less. They are not twins, they are sisters. They have the same father and the same mother. Just as the three of them, Hannah, Miriam, and Berta, that is herself, are three sisters with the same father and the same mother and look like one another, yet are different. Hannah and Miriam, for example, have black hair, pitch black, while she, Berta, has red hair, bright red, and braided in such a way that it looks a little like a squirrel's tail. Such are the girl's thoughts as she wades through the moist leaves and evening falls on the woods. In times when history still moved slowly, events were few and far between and easily committed to memory. They formed a commonly accepted backdrop for thrilling scenes of adventure in private life. Nowadays, history moves at a brisk clip. A historical event, though soon forgotten, sparkles the morning after with the dew of novelty. No longer a backdrop, it is now the adventure itself an adventure enacted before the backdrop of the commonly accepted banality of private life. Uncle Fedya, the, the cat called, that's no way to uh, eat a sandwich. The meat never touches your tongue. Take off the bottom slice of bread. Eat the sandwich meat side down. It will taste better. Uncle Fedya tried it, the sandwich, it tastes better. <laughs> Sometimes the minister gave his poets a dose of their own medicine. Not long ago, one of them had come, come to him wailing and moaning about how he had nowhere to live, how he had a wife and children to support on all but non-existent royalties, and so on and so forth. And the minister had glanced up at the poor poetic creature and said, as calmly as you please, what do you expect? We're all pawns on the chessboard of life. That shut him up all right. <laughs> and now this check. Another day, another scandal. You won't believe this, baby, but he's locked himself in his room and won't answer the phone. And yesterday, right in front of Persia, he threatened suicide. Why would he want to kill himself, asked Vonda. A check. How should I know? They're a bunch of babies, those poets. <laughs> While the gypsy girls were with me, Jesus and Lao Tse had been standing together in the drum of my hydraulic press. Now that I was alone again, wound in wires of flesh flies but left to my own devices and the routine of my work, I saw Jesus as a tennis champion who, just, who has just won his first Wimbledon and Lao Tse as a destitute merchant. I saw Jesus in the sanguine corporeality of his ciphers and symbols and Lao Tse in a shroud pointing at an unhewn plank. I saw Jesus as a playboy and Lao Tse as an old gland abandoned bachelor. I saw Jesus raising an imperious arm to damn his enemies and Lao Tse lowering his arm like broken wings. I saw Jesus as a romantic, Lao Tse as a classicist. Jesus as the flow, Lao Tse as the ebb, Jesus as spring, Lao Tse as autumn. Jesus as the embodiment of love for one's neighbor, Lao Tse as the height of emptiness, Jesus as 
progressus ad futurum, Lao Tse as regressus ad originem. The students' thoughts turned to Vasilisa. If she wept, it meant the things that had happened to Peter on that terrible night had some relevance for her. He turned back. The lone fire glimmered peacefully in the dark and there were no longer any people near it. Again, he thought that if Vasilisa wept and her daughter was flustered, then clearly what he just told them about events taking place 19 centuries earlier was relevant to the present, to both women, and probably to this backwater village, to himself, and to everyone on earth. Since we can no longer assume any single historical event, no matter how recent, to be common knowledge, I must treat events dating back only a few years as if they were a thousand years old. In 1939, German troops marched into Bohemia and the Czech state ceased to exist. In 1945, Russian troops marched into Bohemia and the country was once again declared an independent republic. But he must have had a reason, baby, said Vonda compassionately, putting her arms around him and planting a noisy kiss on his biceps. She was trying to think of the reasons why famous people, not necessarily Czechs, had committed suicide. But the minister pushed her away and scratched the place she had just kissed. He claims somebody stole a novel he wrote, his masterpiece, he says. Another lunatic. Why don't they watch who they invite? But that's a perfectly good reason, baby, said Vonda, nibbling on the minister's ear. If he goes through with it, the shit'll really hit the fan. How will we know? Push is up there banging on his door this very minute. Vonda pictured the fat check. For some reason, she was sure he was fat. Taking off his tie, a blue tie with red stripes, fashioning it into a noose, throwing it over a light fixture, testing whether it would hold, and then... She gave the cat a bite and asked, how do you know my name? <laughs> I live in the attic. I can see everyone in the house from up there. Unfortunately, my attic is closed for repairs at, that mo at the moment, and I have nowhere to go. Uh, who taught you to speak? Uncle Fede asked. <laughs> Which is why sometimes I feel that here, surrounded by Dutch and communicating in English, I am learning my native language from scratch. It's not easy. I swallow words, regurgitate vowels and consonants. It's a losing battle. I fail to convey what I want to say, and what I do say sounds empty. I come out with a word, but can't sense its substance, or else I'll sense a certain substance, but can't find the word for it. Anyway, I went on pushing the green button and the red button until at last I'd thrown the final armful of repulsive blood-stained paper into the drum, cursing the butchers from cramming my cellar full of the stuff, yet blessing them for bringing me Jesus and Lao Tse. So in the last bail, I put a metaphysics of morals by Immanuel Kant, and the flesh flies went berserk, attacking the last bits of dried and drying blood with such gluttony that they failed to notice the drum wall crushing and compacting them, separating them into membranes and cells. I fastened the compacted cube with wire and wheeled it out, surrounded by what was left of the still crazed flies, to join the 14 other bales, all of which were also strewn with flies, green or metallic blue flies shining on every black, red drop of blood, each bale like a gigantic side of beef hanging from a hook in a provincial butcher's shop at hot high noon. And this Altman, he had a sideline delivering beauties to pubs and bars all over the district, and the young ladies would sleep in Altman's back room. Or when summer came, they set up tents in the garden, and the dean of the church would take his constitutional along the fence, and those show-offs would put a Victrola out there and sing and smoke and tan themselves in their bathing suits. At that moment, at that very moment, the girl in the woods takes the small round mirror in the mother of pearl frame out of her pocket, and brings it up to her face. First she sees her freckled nose, then her eyes and red squirrel tail hair. And then her face disappears slowly, gradually. First the freckles on her nose, then the nose itself, then the eyes. Her breath 
spreads across the mirror like a thin film across a green apple, but she continues to hold the mirror in front of her face because now she sees the woods and the swaying oak leaves. A bird flies up out of a bush suddenly but noise noiselessly. A tiny butterfly, the color of rust and faded leaves, vanishes against the trunk of an oak. A deer comes to a sudden standstill and as if stunned, only to dart off again an, in, an instant later. A dead branch falls from a tree. A spider's web with a drop of dew refracting a blood red sunbeam begins to quiver. A pine cone has fallen silently. A branch snapped without a sound as if made of ashes. The people showed great enthusiasm for Russia, which had driven the Germans from their country. And because they considered the Czech Communist Party its faithful representative, they shifted their sympathies to it. I looked up and realized that Jesus and Lao Tse had disappeared up the whitewashed stairs like the turquoise and velvet violet skirts of my gypsy girls before them, and looked down and realized that my pitcher was empty. And so it happened that in February 1948, the communists took power, not in bloodshed and violence, but to the cheers of about half the population. And please note, the half that cheered was the more dynamic, the more intelligent, the better half. If the old woman wept, it was not because he was a moving storyteller, but because Peter was close to her, and her whole being was concerned with what was going on in Peter's soul. I keep wondering whether a language thus maimed, a language that has never learned to depict reality, complex as the inner re experience of that reality may be, is capable of doing anything at all, telling stories, for instance. It cannot be denied that he himself contributed to the confusion, answering the most innocent questions about his origins with a wave of the hand broad enough to take in both the neighboring hamlet and half the horizon. A sight for sore eyes it was, a heavenly sight, Eden on earth, which is why the dean took all those inspection tours along the fence, that and the rotten luck he had with his priests. <laughs> oh, I picked up a word here and there, the cat <laughs> replied. And I once lived with a professor who studied animal language. You are lost without language those days. You could be made into a head or a collar or even a doormat. Come and live with me, Uncle Fedez suggested. Baby, Vonda whispered, all goose pimples, her hand inching down to the minister's wand, but finding a limp blob in its place. Vonda was disappointed. She loved everything connected with those unmentionables. They lifted her out of the everyday world and into an erotic Disneyland where male wizards turned her into something she felt closer to her true being. She loved the magic transformation of that silly little fleshy blob into a smooth pink shiny wand. She loved breasts puffing up like balloons, nipples springing out of hiding, wombs widening in wonder at its approach. They were the only toys we grown-ups have left, she thought, and lately they seemed more and more inclined to break in her hands. She turned to the wall and with her thumb in her mouth wondered when it would be time to throw the toy into the well. He won't do it, babe, she said softly. And all at once he felt a stirring of joy in his soul and even paused for a moment to catch his breath. The past, he thought, is tied to the present in an unbroken chain of events flowing one out of the other. And he felt he had just seen both ends of that chain. He had touched one end and the other had moved. So I stumbled up the stairs on all threes my head spinning from too loud a solitude, and not until I'd made it to the back alley and breathed some fresh air in my lungs could I pick myself up again and get a firm grip on the pitcher. For my readers, thank you very much.
So, um, as promised, we wanted to open this up to anybody who wants to make any, uh, tell any stories about Michael Heim. Uh, before we do that, I want to mention that the book, The uh, Creature uh, <laughs> Spawned in a Bar in Kansas City, um, <laughs> is actually on sale there in the corner for anybody who wants it. I believe it's a special sale price for this event, um, and they do take credit cards if you, if you want. And it's been published by uh, open letter uh, books. I believe Chad Post was in the bar also at the same time when this was happening and may have been at a neighboring table. This was before he went out to ride the mechanical bull. Um, so it's true, isn't it? <laughs> and so uh, when he heard about the project, he was in. Um, anyway, so if anyone would like to come up and say anything about Michael, uh, please feel free. Um, I do want to start by saying um, I once asked him about his motivation for, for studying other languages, and he said if there was a, it was the shortest answer he ever gave, I believe, if there was a, a writer worth translating in that language, then the language was worth learning. <laughs> 